Hello and welcome everyone to another InventRight hour of Q&A. My name is Andrew Krauss. I co-founded InventRight with Stephen Key over 20 years ago. We're coming up on our 21 year anniversary. I need to check out when that is as a company. And what we do is we coach and mentor inventors to license their products, which means that big company uses their money, not yours, their workforce, not yours, and their existing distribution, not yours. So if they're in 30,000 stores, you're in 30,000 stores. So that's what licensing is. You don't need to start a business. You don't need to spend 10 grand on a patent and five grand on a prototype. I'm sure I'll answer some questions, you know, that relate to that sort of thing tonight. And um, we're going to do a full hour of, of q and It should be a lot of fun. Um, I absolutely love YouTube. So I'm not just a YouTuber. I'm also a fan of YouTube. And I highly recommend you guys to use YouTube to get great information about inventing and, and everything else. If I need to fix something in my house, um, the other day I, my AC in my truck went out. And uh, for some reason, I just got a bug. I'm like, you know, I have it. I can do this myself. I watched like five YouTube videos, watched them all like twice. And I fixed the AC in my truck by myself. And I'm not a super geeky mechanical guy. I'm pretty handy, but I'm not an engineer. I'm more of a marketing guy. And I was able to do it. So um, definitely if I'm able to fix my AC um, using YouTube, you guys can learn more about licensing using YouTube. So hopefully um, you find this really useful. We're going to do a whole hour of Q&A. For those of you that haven't been here before, I tend to answer questions very fast um, because, you know, more information you can get, the better. So if you guys could start typing your questions into the questions box, we exclusively guide people to license, not to venture. Venturing is just a fancy way of saying, make it and sell it yourself. Licensing is, I'm going to, I used to use the word sell, but really rent. I'm going to rent my idea to this big company. They're going to invest their money, their workforce, and their distribution. And you move on to other ideas. Maybe you have a new version of the product for them. You show it to them. Maybe you have some suggestions, but you don't have to run a business. You keep your day job, keep whatever other business you have, and you can license products the rest of your life. Um, I decided to go geeky today and keep my headset because this thing has been a little buggy on me. So even though I look silly with it, I think you guys get good audio. Um, and if somebody could type in yes, if you can hear me, just to make sure I haven't been rambling to deaf ears for the last two minutes and 48 seconds, that would be great. All right, I'll wait for one person to type yes. Okay, then we're good. <laughs> All right, so let's get going, guys. Um, this is from Matt. Hi, Andrew. Is the PPA, provisional patent application, patent pending status concept, commonly understood by companies? that work with outside inventors, just wondering if when you go to negotiate the deal. Um, and then the other part of the question is, companies paying for the patent, if there may be confusion on their port, for example, you said that patent, pen, you said this is patent pending and you haven't even filed for utility patent yet. So when you file, we guide our invent rights students to file what's called a provisional patent application, commonly referred to as a PPA. And so for those of you that are new, um, this is going to be like, whoa. And for those of you, a lot of you already know it, like I already know what that is, Andrew. Um, hopefully there, I'll include some helpful information here for you as well. So when you file a provisional patent application, if you've ever looked at a patent, it's confusing. And you looked at the word and you're like, I couldn't do that. And you're right. You shouldn't file your own patent. It's too hard. It's too difficult. There's too many pitfalls. And you should rely on an attorney to file a full utility patent. But for a provisional patent, it was meant to be written by the layman in common English. Let me see if I can adjust this a little bit. There you go. In common English so that anybody can do it. So it doesn't need to be written like when you see a patent in Google Patents or USPTO.gov, the patent office website, like I couldn't do that. You don't need to do that. It can be written in common English. Anybody can do it. One of the major things I always like to say, which might be good for you guys that are already familiar with what a PPA is, if you're not thinking about this, is 80% of filing a provisional patent is just thinking about the other versions of it, including them. It's just being an inventor. 
It's not about legal speak or anything like that. So you want to think about the version. It's 80% as good, just as good, but not the version you're pitching. 70% as good. But don't throw a version that's half as good. That's just a waste of your time. And I see some inventors getting obsessive about including all these variations that wouldn't even be a good variation, wouldn't be viable in the marketplace, wouldn't make sense. It's kind of silly. That's just a waste of your time. But you should throw every variation in there that you think is viable. And before we get keep going today, I want to let you guys know that anything I share today is not legal advice. Please see the services of an attorney. Um, these, this is just an open discussion. Okay, so nothing I offer today is legal advice. Um, and always check with an attorney before you take any action whatsoever. So Matt's asking, um, do companies know what a PPA is? Am I lying? Essentially what he's saying is, am I lying when I say patent pending when it's not? But it is, Matt. So here's your misperception. When you file a provisional patent application, it gives you a year to file a full utility. And what it does is for whatever is in there, whatever you're claiming protection on, you get that date. So if I filed a provisional patent six months ago, I get that date from six months ago. And if I file a full utility patent, I can reference or the attorney will reference that provisional as the priority date for whatever was in there. So legally, you can say patent pending when you have a provisional patent. I know you might think it's kind of deceptive, but it's truly not. And the patent office says it's perfectly fine to say patent pending when you have a provisional patent because in a way it kind of is pending because you file a provisional and if you later file a full utility, you can reference that provisional. Now, if you never file a full utility, it'll be as if that provisional patent never existed. And, you know, and so that's the case, but while you've got that year that the patent office gives you from the date you file that provisional, you can legally put patent pending on your marketing materials. You don't have to say provisional patent pending and advise you say patent pending. I have never seen a company pissed off at one of our students go, oh, you lied to me. I thought you had a patent. You just have a provisional patent. I've never, ever once seen that happen. Maybe it happened once and somebody said it to their coach and I didn't know about it. Maybe. But it's, it's not something I think you should concern yourself about. Um, filing... A full patent, and this is, goes on the other end, which is complete craziness, and sitting waiting one to three years for it to issue and then approaching to companies is freaking ridiculous. <laughs> Maybe the product's not even relevant by the time the patent issues. So getting a provisional patent, paying the patent office fee of 70 bucks, our students use our smart IP solution to use that software to, file the, to write the provisional and then file it with the patent office. And the patent office fee is only $70. If you get a patent attorney to write a provisional for you, they'll typically charge 800 to 2,500. Some of them will go, well, I want to write it like a full utility. So when we need to upgrade, it only costs you a thousand more. And it's kind of their way, if you ask me, of getting more out of money out of you up front, knowing you're not going to do anything with it. Because most inventors file patents, don't do anything with it. And I, I don't like that. Um, might make sense in certain isolated incidents. So getting back to Matt's question, so he's worried that they're going to say, oh, you haven't filed a patent. This is a provisional. And the answer is it's not a problem. Um, so just go forward, you know. And a lot of times you need to make some changes. So imagine this. You spent 10 grand on a patent. Like, this is what it is. You decided this is what it is. A lot of times you get feedback from companies. You're going to change what the product is. And you're going to file another $10,000 patent. It's freaking nuts. Why would you do that? doesn't make any sense. Now, when you know how to license, you what you want to do ideally is file a provisional patent like the week before you're ready to start contacting companies. You've got a whole friggin' year to see if there's interest. Using our approach, you would never need a year on like 98% of products. The reason why inventors file a provisional and run out of time is because they file a provisional, get the warm and fuzzies, they're protected. I get that. And it's great to feel good about having some sort of uh, potential protection in the long run. Because when you file a provisional patent, it doesn't give you a right to sue. It's not a patent. You're absolutely right, Matt. Unless you file a full utility, reference that provisional, and then that patent issues, you won't have protection from that date. But it's perceived protection and companies respect, respect patent pending status. They just do. They don't have to, but they do. You know? Um, and what's great about it also is it gives you an upper hand. They don't know 
what you've protected or what you haven't. So it's fantastic. Even when you file a full utility patent, after 18 months, the public can see it, even if the patent office hasn't, got, office hasn't gotten back to you with office actions to grant certain things or not. And a company could look at what you're trying to get. With a provisional patent, they can't look at anything, nothing, nada. It's a great tool. So they, they, it keeps honest people honest. It's an amazing tool, guys. It really is. So, Matt, don't worry about it. It's perfectly legal. It's perfectly acceptable. And from a practical standpoint, it will not piss off companies. And if it does, they're not the right company. There's something weird going on there if that really makes them mad. Um, and then Matt said, really appreciate the time you take out of your life to do this. You're welcome, Matt. I love doing it. Um, if you guys haven't been here before, after an hour, you'll see I love answering questions. So let's see what we got up next. Um, and type your first name if you can so I don't have to read the handle. It's more personal if I can read your first name. But if we got a handle, that's fine too. So uh, JCH Express, hi and thank you. Are products which are licensed typically new and unique or do most have a twist on an already existing product in the marketplace? Probably both, but just wanted to know the majority. So um, most products are a variation of something that's already out there. Most. And probably people are always like, oh, but because inventors have this, a lot of inventors have this, oh, there's nothing like it mentality. And that is a bad mentality to have with with companies too. Oh, there's nothing like it. That's the worst thing a marketing manager never wants to hear that you say that. And actually, if there's something somewhat like it, that's a big plus in your favor. Oh, there's these uh, eight barbecue spouses over here. And I know those are selling well. And then I just made this slight tweak. And so they're like, oh, like, well, I know those are selling well. And if we make your product with a little extra something to it, maybe if it's next to some of these others, they'll purchase ours over others. So it's a good thing if you have a slight variation on something that's out there. And sometimes those are the easiest products to license because they can see it's selling well and then you've got a slight variation to it. So it's very, very common. But then also people say, well, there's nothing like it. And I look at it, I'm like, and like 98% of the time, I'm like, there is something like it. There's something over here. You're of a different solution, but there is a solution over here with a different type of product. And so that's, to me, is something like it. And yeah, you have a different solution. No, it's not the exact same thing, or maybe it's substantially different. But if people are solving the problem in a very different way, there is something like it, in my opinion. It might not be like yours, but they're solving the problem or something close to it in a different way. So um, quite often, it's a variation. We have students that have mind-blowing improvements to existing products. Um, just like, whoa, this is really different. You know, and then other ones that, ooh, it's just like a slight little tweak. And it's all good. You can do all of it. Um, so the answer, uh, JH, JCH Express, is that um, it's both. Uh, but what you want to do at the core is look at the micro category. If it's a barbecue spatula or wine bottle opener, whatever it is, look at the micro category. Look at all those products in that space. And, you know, sometimes it will take you like four to six hours to do that. It's worth your time investment. A lot of people don't do it because they're afraid of what they're going to find. And that's just like like being a little child, putting your face, your hands on your mask going, it's not there. It's not there. If I don't can't see it, it's not there. Don't, don't do that. But you don't want to see it. So psychologically, you don't dig as deep to see what's out there. But your goal is not to prove nothing like it exists. Your goal is to study all the products in the space. Oh, there's five over there that have that, and there's three over here, and there's, oh, well, mine's going to fit in here. Not, oh, that one sucks, that one sucks, mine's better than that, that blows, that sucks. That's, a, that's the wrong attitude. You want to kick back, chill, don't be defensive, look at everything else out there. How does mine fit in? And maybe you need to make some tweaks based on looking and making observing of how it fits in with all the other products in the space. And Google Images is a great one of my favorite tools to do that. Not regular Google, but Google Images. You got to type a lot of different keywords. Most people that are new at it, they kind of suck at it. You know, they tell me they didn't find anything. I'll do a search in 30 seconds. I'm like, well, what's this? And you know, but it's not like this gotcha where it's like, oh, we can't get around this. Rarely that's the case. It's like you just have to be aware of these other products. So that's a great question. Um, Alan, license. License the idea or the patent? 
uh, what's the difference and what would be the best? You're always licensing. I love that question, Alan. You're always licensing the benefit of the product. So if it helps you flip burgers without them falling apart, it helps you open a wine bottle without the hassle or whatever it is, or keeps your car air fresh, what, those, that's the true core of what you're licensing. You are not licensing the patent. Okay. And ideally, if we can get, and we, when we help our students through negotiations, if we can make the whole thing not dependent on the patent at all, that's ideal. So they have to pay you regardless of whatever patents issue, they're paying you for the product. But the core of what you're licensing is really the benefit because that's the marketing. That's what they're going to sell. That's what people buy. People buy benefits. They go, oh, that product has that benefit. I want it. I'm going to buy that. So you're licensing the product, not the patent. Now, sometimes they'll, they'll insist on having that included, but it's actually stronger if you don't even mention the patent. They have to pay you regardless of any patents. But sometimes you will reference the patent. If you file the provisional patent, try to – I talked to a student just the other day, and our negotiation coach, Paul, helped him get a deal done where they gave him the money because he'd only filed a provisional for 70 bucks. They give him the money, and he'll give that money to his attorney. His attorney will file a patent, and then the patent attorney will reference that provisional. Now, sometimes companies are stubborn about that. No problem. Get some sort of advance. Maybe it's enough to pay for the patent. Maybe it's enough to partially pay for it. Use that money to then file a patent. You're always filing the patent yourself. You don't want them to file it and it's not their patent because you're not selling your idea. You're renting or leasing it. If they don't perform under the licensing agreement, nothing to do with the patent, the, the contract, you get it back. So you're always renting your idea. And it's better if it's not dependent on the patent. Quite often it is. It's fine. Some, kind, some companies are like, we don't care about patents. You can file something if you want, in which case it wouldn't be dependent on the patents. So um, you're always at the core licensing the benefit of your product or the next step up is your product. And if you don't have to make it dependent on the patent, great. Now, some industries are like, oh, the patent's really important to us. It's going to be wrapped up in the contract. That's fine as well. Um, Debbie, how long can someone receive royalties indefinitely? And, you know, even though, uh, I mean, ideally in like this dream scenario, even if a patent is 20 years, if you're helping them keep the product up to date with a new version or new iteration or line accessions, you can go beyond 20 years. Now, does that happen often? Probably not. But you could indefinitely keep patents and uh, keep, keep earning royalties on a product. So um, it's for as long as it sells. And you should give them the rights, in my opinion, to continue to sell it and earn royalties as long as they're meeting those minimums that you and them have decided on. We help our students negotiate how much they need to pay you every quarter minimum. So now they often go way beyond that. So you don't want them to sit on a product that they're not selling or is selling at an abysmally low rate. But they don't want to sit on a product that's not selling well. If it's not selling well, they're going to hand it back to you or they're going to try some other things. But you never want to do a contract that doesn't have guarantees so you can't take it back if they're not performing and they could just sit on it. Companies, that's not their intention. A few bad apples it might be, but that's why we never let our students do deals without minimum guarantees and other um, uh, requirements in order to keep the license. So, Debbie, the answer is indefinitely, you know, and you want them to keep keep it indefinitely as long as they're selling certain volumes. And you have to interview them a lot to figure out what those are. Um, William says, hi, Andrew, is it always necessary to get a professionally done patent search? No, I mean, we have um, patent training, patent searching trainings inside our membership site for our students. And um, but here's the thing. But whenever somebody says the word patent search, I always go to this default answer. I, the first thing you do when you come up with an idea should never, ever, for one second on any product on the face of the planet, I'm saying this so you listen, um, do a patent search. You should always, 100% of the time, at the first, do a market search. Get on Google Images, get on Amazon, get el go elsewhere, and look at what is or isn't in the marketplace. It tells you so much. It tells you what is or isn't selling, what's out there, and when you do a patent search, it's not nearly as telling because people patent companies and individuals patent all sorts of crazy stuff that makes no sense, isn't manufacturable, not manufacturable at a reasonable price. It is 
extremely unvaluable information the vast majority of the time. It's not any sort of litmus test on what makes sense. And some of these patent invention promotion companies, these, these scam companies, they'll do a patent. Oh, we didn't find anything. So therefore it makes sense. And the inventor's like, oh yeah, yeah. Because we didn't find anything in the past. That doesn't mean sh anything. I was going to swear, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do that. Um, but what's in the market, what is or is in the market tells you what's selling. And it's not going to stay in the market if it's not selling well. What is or is in patent, it just means somebody threw a bunch of money in an attorney and they filed a patent. Now, I'm not saying don't do a patent search. But after you do a market search, it makes lots of sense. Now it makes sense to do a patent search, but very rarely is it a problem. Um, and we have trainings to teach our students to how to do a patent search. If you're going to do a professional patent search, 100% of the time I recommend you try to find as much stuff as you can and then hand it off to a professional patent searcher. Because quite often, a lot of these professional patent searches, and we do them, um, and you can pay us to do patent searches. A lot of them are junk and the patent searcher will spend two hours. The inventor doesn't give them all the information they should. And then the inventor gets warm and fuzzies. Oh, they didn't find anything, but they didn't spend enough time and they weren't clear enough about what the product is. So at InventRight, when people pay us to do a patent search, um, we make sure the, the inventor has really done as much as they can themselves to hand that off to the patent searcher. And I'll personally talk to them. And a lot of times I'm like, you don't need a patent search. You just need to do that yourself. I don't see that this is a category where there's any huge issues here. Um, but I always recommend 100% of the time, if you're going to pay somebody to do it, which it does make sense sometimes to really know everything that's in the space, especially when it's in product categories where they're very difficult. It's a difficult industry. And you can really go forward with lots of confidence, really understanding the intellectual property in that space. And that can be very beneficial. So as with anything, there's not this black and white. Should you do it? Shouldn't you do it? It really depends on what's right for you. But I think you should always try to do a search yourself to find as much as you can. And it's not that hard. Um, it really isn't that hard. But the market search, way more important. Um, let's see. Okay, Jeff says, contacting potential licensees through LinkedIn who are already connected to InventRight extended family, got to make sure not to use Benjamin's established icebreakers. Um, I don't know what you mean, Jeff. Let me know what your question is. Yeah, so we, we believe heavily in reaching out to potential licensees through LinkedIn. So, but Jeff, if you could type in what your question is, I'll page down a little bit and look for it. I'm not sure what your question is, but I'll jump back to you. So please type it in. Um, uh, Jason, I have come up with an invention that nobody has ever invented yet. Yeah, never say that. Uh, <laughs> kind of a joke, kind of not. And I have a building, a building or investor, I don't know what that means, that wants, to, that wants spelled O-N-C-E, to get my inventions going for 2020 before 2021 that involves stopping the floods and fires. Okay. So, okay. Can you type in your question, Jason? Um, so type in your question, Jason, again, then I'll go back. That's not a question, just a statement. Um, let's see. Nick says, how should a college student balance class with writing a PPA slash licensing? I love that question, Nick. We have a lot of um, our students are, are in college. Um, some of them can't afford the, the three grand for the half a year of coaching or they don't feel like they have time. But it, whether you're in college or have a business or, or, um, or have a busy job, if you have two to six hours a week, that's enough time. So Nick, with your college classes and everything, if you have two to six hours a week, you have enough. Now, when you're a student of ours and we're coaching you, two to six hours a week is a very effective two to six hours. It's not two to six hours of you thinking about what to do and being confused and researching. It's doing the friggin' work. 
And so, because a coach is like, looked at your project, no, this is the right next to do, and you have this extreme confidence or fair confidence, and then your coach is checking and double checking your work. Whereas opposed to, I think a lot of inventors working by themselves, they feel like they're going in circles. Like they'll set aside some time and they'll spend four hours going, I don't know what I should do. Maybe I should look at this, maybe that. And they're kind of guessing as to what to do. It's not the right thing to do, or if it is the right thing to do, they're not doing it right. So, as long as you have two to six hours, Nick, I think you have enough time to do this. You don't, it's not like you're starting this whole business and this company and you need funding. You need any of that, you know, uh, but you do need time. You Sometimes Steve and I make licensing seem really simple and it is, but you can't do it with no time. You got to make a list of 20, 30 companies. You got to make some marketing materials, file a PPA, do a little research, reach out to companies. And you need to spend time every week. Make it part of your weekly routine, Nick. And two to six hours is fine. So don't. But people kind of like they get excited one week and then don't do anything the next week. I don't find that works. So whether you're a student of ours or not, I think make it part of your weekly routine. It'll make a massive difference. It's like learning a language. It's not nearly as hard as that if you ask me or anything else. But it's something you need to do every week. Uh, Benjamin, it's kind of a general question, Benjamin. How do you negotiate the royalties? Um, well, you don't early on. You have discussions about the product. And if they want to talk about it, you kind of put it off a little bit. You say, yeah, I'd be happy to discuss the royalties with you, but I need to understand, like, what are you going to do with it first? So you kind of put it back on them. Because sometimes they'll be like, well, what do you want? And you're like, well, I want a reasonable royalty per unit. So when you guys make money, I would get paid a small royalty. And their knee-jerk reaction is always, well, what is that? What is that? And you say, well, it's all going to depend on what you're going to do with it. We can discuss that when the right time comes um, or, you know, sometime soon. But I like to talk to you first. And you start getting the conversations with them. And it's really best if they can pull the trigger. But there's a lot of information you want to gather about what their confusions are, how they're going to move forward with the project. And you want to help them with that stuff. And you're not talking about royalties early on. Sometimes it'll come up, but we give our students techniques, the one I just said, and many others, to discuss that. Um, but usually, to basically answer your question, how do you negotiate royalties, get them to pull the trigger first. But it's not just about the royalty. It's about knowing how much volume they're going to sell, what the price point is, the product. If, if It doesn't matter if you get this great royalty if they're only going to sell 1,000 units a year. But you might be smaller, okay with a smaller royalty if they're going to sell half a million. So it's all relative, and you got to kind of run the numbers and figure out what you're okay with. Um, so let's see what else we got here. So David said, can you elaborate on – I think you asked this question, David, last week. Can you elaborate on getting a PPA in the U.K.? It's file a U.S. provisional patent, um, David. Um, you can use our smart IP software on inventright.com to do that. Um, or you can find some sort of other resource and you can write a U.S. provisional patent yourself. doesn't matter where you are in the world. It's for a micro entity. If you're earning under, there's like a spreadsheet on their web, the patent office site. If you're under, earning under 150K or so, don't quote me on that dollar figure. Annual household income or under, it's like 70. It's double that if you earn more, but you wouldn't have to pay more than 140. And so... You can find some other resources. The easiest one is just to use our smart IP software, David. Um, but you could be anywhere in the world and you get charged the same amount as a U.S. citizen. So don't worry about that. And you can do it just the same as a U.S. citizen. So um, uh, Jules said, I noticed to prepare a provisional patent, they don't work for people with a design patent. Yes, there is no provisional design patent. And a design patent is affordable, but it's still more expensive than a provisional because a provisional is only 70 bucks. I think by the time the end, by the time it's said and done, a design patent will probably cost you about 1500 So there is no provisional design patent and there never will be. And with a design patent, you have to do the drawings a specific way. You can't just sketch something yourself like you can with a prov provisional. It has to be done by a professional patent drafter because it's very specific. Um, so, yeah. And But the question is, you can actually file a, a provisional patent on anything, 
even if it's not viably patentable later, you can legally file a provisional patent because it's all debatable on what's patentable or not. And they could reject it later, but you can still get that patent pending status for 70 bucks on something you full well know is not going to get granted. And still legally say patent pending for an entire year. So a lot of our students, when it's covered more by a design patent than a utility, they'll just spend the 70 on the provisional patent to get that perceived protection. And they won't spend 1500 on a design patent. You could probably get it done more affordably elsewhere. Um, so, but anyway, so that was, hopefully that was helpful, David. Um, David's other question is, do you sign your own name on a licensing contract? Uh, we always advise our students to file um, a file in the, if they're in the U.S. an LLC or a corporation. So it's not under your own name, but it's under a corporation. I'm less concerned about that if you're overseas in the U.K. So let's say you got this you know, ladder product and somebody could sue you. I, and I cover this in a lot of these Q&As, but some of you might haven't heard of this before. But you're covered when you're licensing from a liability standpoint every which way till Tuesday. I've never had one of our students get sued by the used, end user of a product. So this, and this is why. When you do a licensing deal with a company, you're covered under their product liability insurance, usually a million or at least $2 million. They have product liability insurance as a company. And you always... We always insist that our students are covered under the company's product liability insurance. And I've never heard of a single case where it costs the company one cent more for them to add the inventor to their product liability insurance. So if somebody sued because they got hurt with the product, first of all, if you're gonna sue somebody, they're gonna sue the company, not you. They don't even know you exist. Because like 99% of our students, they're not putting the, we have a few companies that do this. They're not putting your picture as the inventor on the package. They don't know you exist. So that's your first level of protection. They don't know you exist. But if they want to sue an individual user, they're going to sue the company. They got the deep pockets. Let's say they research and see there's a patent holder. They probably don't want to sue you. But if they did sue you because you insisted in the licensing agreement that they're covered, you're covered under their product liability insurance, you'll still be covered for a million or two, right? Okay. Um, now, David, you're in the UK. So... Just the fact that you're in the UK, some US citizen doesn't want to pay to sue somebody in the UK, okay? So even if you didn't do an LLC or a corporation, you probably have different business entities in the UK. I'm not sure exactly what they are, but they don't want to sue somebody overseas. It's even more of a hassle, okay? And they also know, so I'm going to sue this inventor that doesn't have deep pockets overseas. Never seen it happen could happen. So all our, our students in the US, we advise them to file what's called when they get into a deal, an LLC, limited liability company, which is very affordable to do, um, or a corporation. And the contract would be under the company, the corporation or LLC. And you could probably do something similar in the UK. And we advise that and they would offer even more protection. So there isn't a single time I know of in 20 years where one of our students have been sued by a customer that got hurt with the product ever. I've never even heard a story where the inventor said some inventor, some consumer sued my licensee either. So one, you're covered by the fact they don't know who you are. Two, they're, you're covered by the fact that if they want to sue somebody, they will sue somebody with deep pockets, not you. Um, and then you're also covered by their product liability insurance, the companies. And then the additional thing we want our students to do is don't do it under your own name. Do it under the LLC or the corporation so that if they sue you, there's no money in there and you just let that go delinquent. You maybe sign a new contract with the company, you know, under a different name. So you could just let that because you just if you're using that just for your inventions, you take the money out every month. There's no money in there to be had. And you just declare you let that company. That's not legal advice, guys. You got to seek an attorney if you get in that situation. But um so that's very detailed advice. So hopefully you guys feel more comfortable. Any of you that have significant assets or don't, and you're worried about that, it, based on everything I just said, it's really not something to be worried about, especially if you cover it like I just explained. Um, Dave, a different, no, same David, says, do you help with licensing contracts? Yeah, our, our negotiation coach helps our students all the way through. When a deal is about 95% done, our negotiation coach Paul will say you need for an hour or two to have an attorney dot the I's and cross the T's but if, if you can't agree on all the major stuff and a lot of the minor stuff there's no sense in calling an attorney you're not signing anything yet 
So we help our students to basically it being done. And then we say, just get an attorney for an hour or two, dot the I's and cross T's. And I'd advise our students to do that in the future as well. Now, if you don't know how to do licensing deals, you know, there's a very good chance you'll muck it up and that wouldn't be good. But we're training our students to do that as well. So in the future, they can get deals to 95% done and only contact the licensing attorney once a more or less done deal. Because if every time you get a little interest, you're reaching out to some licensing attorney for three, four, five hundred dollars an hour. That is not the invent right approach and it doesn't keep your costs down. And they're notorious for killing deals by nitpicking deals to death. So they can get more billable hours out of you before you know it. They killed the deal and the company's pissed and they still send you a bill. So um, you have to be practical with it. But again, everything I'm saying tonight is not legal advice. And I always advise you have an attorney, dot the licensing attorney only. It's the only person you should have go over a final contract is a licensing attorney, not general contract, not your patent attorney that looks at a licensing contract four times a year. Stupid, 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 don't do that. The only person that should be looking at a final licensing contract is a licensing attorney. All they do is licensing agreements. Now, I don't find them to be good at closing deals. I find them to be terrible at closing deals. So I think we, I'm biased, we're much better at helping people close deals. And then our students, once they become empowered with those skills, they can do it themselves just fine. Um, it is probably one of the harder things to learn. I'm, I would admit that. Um, Zam says, how much time do we have left? 24 minutes, cool. Zam says, hello, is there a way to turn a design into utility so that the PPA can be filed no PPA for designs. No, a design patent is the way something looks, not the way something functions. And a utility patent is the way something functions for lack of a better description. There's, you cannot convert a design patent to utility. It's not one of the same. In a utility, you're making claims like this hinge is doing this and has this functionality. You're doing none of that in design patent. It's literally just a picture. And if it looks the same and has the same shape, and for the lack of a better explanation, what a design patent is, then they might be in violation, but otherwise, and that's why design patents are very limited, but they can come in handy sometimes. Um, Ida says, good evening, Andrew, and thanks for great info. You're welcome, Ida. Um, uh, David says, can I put patent pending on a sell sheet when I didn't, but plan to? When I get advice from you on InventRight, I don't, it's not a complete sentence, David. When I, I'm assuming that you're going to say, can I put patent pending on the sell sheet if I didn't actually file the provisional? And I'm going to assume that's what your question is because it's going to be a good answer for everybody. And the answer is absolutely not. You can only put le legally put patent pending on the sell sheet when you file that provisional for 70 bucks. You cannot legally do that if you haven't. Okay. Uh, Christopher, we get this all the time. I save people God knows how much money all the time on this. Christopher says, how bad is it if my PPA expires next month? It's not bad at all, Christopher. But here's, the, here's what you got to pay attention to. If you have not publicly disclosed it, people go, what is it publicly disclosed, Andrew? Which is fine because a lot of you don't know what that is. If you haven't put it up on a public website, if you haven't put it up on YouTube privately, Unlisted YouTube's fine because nobody can see it except for people who send the link. If you if you put it, you haven't sold it as a swap me, if you haven't made public disclosure and privately showing it to companies, Christopher, is not public disclosure. With the American Events Act, they changed that where that is not public disclosure. So if you've just showed it to companies privately via email, not public disclosure, anything else, selling it publicly, putting it up on a website, putting it up on a public YouTube, putting it up on your Facebook, that's all public disclosure. And if you have that up for then a year and you've made a public disclosure and you haven't filed a patent on it, you're toast. But if you haven't made a public disclosure, it's not a big deal. Patent attorneys get inventors all the time this way. They make you believe you're going to lose your rights. And you will lose that original date from your provisional you filed 11 months ago, Christopher. But if you just file that same provisional again today, you'll get a year from today. A year from today. You won't get protection from there. But I, And I have students and non-students, I've told people about this all the time, and I have never talked to a single inventor where that bit them in the butt. Yeah, if somebody invented something similar in that frame of time, it could bite you in the butt. But is it worth $10,000 patent to risk that? It's not, 99 times out of 100, and I've never seen it happen. So if you haven't made public disclosure, Christopher, you can file that same provisional again, 
for 70 bucks and get a year from today. Okay. So um, there you go. I save. And sometimes attorneys are honest about that. Quite often I find that they're not. They give you this impression that you lose your rights. Yes, you'll lose that priority date from that first provisional. But if you file it again, you're good. So don't worry about that, Christopher. But here's the thing, guys. Don't go filing provisionals all the time and sit on your hands. Like if you don't know how to license it, kind of part of me is saying don't bother. Now, it's not the end of the world if you file it and you sit on your hands. You're like, I wanted to get that priority date. Okay. And you wait six months. Then you start trying to sell it. But And yeah, you'd be protected from that date if somebody else files in that period of time. But there's really no point if you're not going to make an effort in reaching out to companies. It gives you this temporary placeholder of some sort of potential protection if you file later file a full utility and reference the provisional. But it's just it's just kind of a waste of time after a while if you just keep doing that. You got to know how to license products. And that's what we're all about at InventRight. Uh, let's see. So thank you for the question, Christopher. Uh, Debbie says, with both your coaching services, both Academy and the one-on-one -on -one coaching, if any services are included, such as Smart IP, Design Studio, and Video Pitch. So um, when you get our one-on-one -on -one coaching program, the half-year one-on-one coaching, um, you get smart IP to follow your provisional. You get a sell sheet with our design studio marketing piece, and you get a virtual prototype with design studio. You get access to your coach for half a year, meet with them every week on video on Skype or um, on the phone. And then you can email them anytime. You also get our negotiation coach for half a year to help you with any negotiations. And then with Academy, it's not it's group coaching, so you can't specifically talk about your invention because you're a group of 20 other people. You just get smart IP with that, and you get a discount for Design Studio. And the one-on-one um, -on -one coaching is three grand, and then the Academy is 900. Um, and there's no, we don't try to sell you anything else during that time, um, and we don't take any percentage, and everything is confidential. So you can say anything to your coach. So that, I hope that answers your question. Um, that was from Debbie. Uh, so, uh, Jules says, I was told that because I have an idea that I need a design patent on. I was told because of that, I can't file a PPA. I was told I can only file a design patent. That's not true because you can file a provisional patent on anything, even if the provisional patent doesn't make sense because it never gets reviewed, guys. You send it down to the patent office, it lets you legally say patent pending. So you that's not true, Jules. Whoever told you that didn't give you the truth. Now, what you might have come across is you said, patent attorney looked at it and they said, well, I don't think there's anything to be covered here with the utility patent. Therefore, I wouldn't recommend filing a provisional. It doesn't mean you can't though, even if there's a very good chance you're not gonna get anything or attorney, it's all opinions their opinion, you're not going to get anything. You can still file a provisional patent. Even if you're a pat 10 patent attorneys say, there's no way you're going to get a, a patent on that. You could still legally file a provisional patent. Um, so that's not true. And that's misinformation. And they didn't give you the whole picture there. That's all I can say. Um, uh, how for a complex digital gadget that are similar in look and feel to existing products, but it's function functionally distinct, what should be the emphasis when filing a PPA? So it's a digital gadget that's similar in look and feel to an existing product, but functionally distinct. Well, that's fantastic, Hal, because um, you want to talk about how it functions differently and what those benefits are. So that's great. You know, you said the key word there with functionality. So you always want to describe the functionality of the product. You know, what is the utility and the functionality of the product? You want to cover that in the PPA and you should be covered pretty well if you talk about that. So don't worry that you're saying it looks similar in feel to other products. You're talking about the point of difference in its functionality. So that's fantastic. And that's what you're, you would get protection on. So that's great. Um, uh, Christopher says free patent office. They give under some income qualifiers, pre-patent services. I'm trying to do that paperwork now. 
Yeah, you know, I, I think they have um, some pro bono programs. The patent office will link you to some attorneys that can file utilities. I don't know of any, I don't, in that program, I don't know of them filing provisional patents. I think it's always utilities. And I just find that to be kind of a waste of time. Um, you have to be pretty broke to qualify for the pro bono program. You have to be pretty low income. And my take, why not just still do, if you can't afford the $70 for a provisional patent, you need to go out and get a job. You need to change your financial situation. You should not be spending one second on inventing if you can't afford $70 for a provisional. You need to get that in order. Maybe that takes you four, six months, eight months to get that in order, then come back and then file a provisional patent. So using their pro, pro, pro bono program, and it's not the patent office, they kind of link you up with some law firms that will file patents pro bono, but you still need to pay the patent office fees, I believe. Um, what's the point? It's getting all wrapped up in a full utility patent, which most of the time you're gonna change what you're protecting anyway. So when you file a provisional and you realize there's some changes, you just file another provisional, then later you file a full utility. So to, to be honest with you, using the event right approach, I see it as kind of a waste of time, Chris. And if you could file a provisional for 60, why do you need the pro bono program to file a full utility? In some instances, it might make sense. Um, but look into that, guys, if you find that you think that would be useful for you. If you're venturing, you're selling your product yourself, okay, might make sense. But if you're licensing, I don't think you need it. Um, Uh, okay. Uh, William. Well, William, I guess he's talking about himself in the third person. William says, William says you and Steve are like the two best people in the world. Okay. I like that. Thank you, William. <laughs> I don't know if you're talking to yourself in the third person, but either way, it was a very nice thing to say. Thank you. We do a lot of, of free education for the community, and a lot of people don't become event rights students, so we still love helping you guys, um, and that's that's perfectly fine. Uh, Mike says, I got interest from a company. They said they love my idea, but they don't know how to move forward with it. What does that mean? You need to get on the phone with them, Mike, and have a conversation about not knowing how to move forward with it. So they might, they may have never done a licensing deal and they don't know how to move forward a licensing deal, but they may have concerns like, oh, I don't know how to make this thing. And you could be like, oh, well, there's this over here. We're just going to change it slightly. And there's things you might be able to help with. So get on the phone with them, talk to them. Now you're a real person. You're not this nameless inventor. You're not just an email. Get on the phone and talk with them is my best advice. And see what hangups they're having. Don't try to do it via email. Big mistake. Talk to them. Set up a time to call. That's great. They don't know how to move forward. No problem. Get those specifics. So I have no idea what part of it they don't know how to move forward on. You have to ask them. And you can ask them via email, but don't be timid. Get on the phone and talk with them. Um, uh, let's see. This is only... Only ran random stuff is the handle. Hi, Andrew. When you call a marketing manager and say you're a product developer, what should you do if they ask for previous examples of products you have licensed if you haven't licensed any yet? They never do. I've only known of two students that the company said, show us your portfolio. We want to see. This is 20 years. We've had students in 65 countries. They don't care. They don't. They just are looking at the product that you're sending right now. If you've got a good sell sheet, they don't care. They don't care if you're you or if you're Stephen Key or if you license 100 products or if you license two they, or license none. It is not an issue. Never, ever let that hold you back. Now, with that said, conduct yourself professionally. Have a great sell sheet. Make sure the product's going to be right for their product line or at least you think it is. Don't send a bicycle product to a company selling mattresses. Do crazy stuff like that. I've seen inventors do that. Oh, they're open. So I'll just send them my product. You don't even look at their product line and the, the product you're sending them doesn't make sense at all based on their product line. That is completely and utterly disrespectful. Oh, but remember I said they're open to, to ideas. Like look at their friggin' product line. You know, so as long as you're doing things professionally, you're fine. Don't worry about it. They won't ask you. They will not ask you. They're just going to judge your marketing materials and that product right in front of them. And 
if they don't want that product, say, oh, are you open to others? And they'll say, oh, yeah, sure, just email me. And now you got their name and their email. Now you're becoming a pro. So you didn't get rejected. You just made a contact. Um, I don't know. Let's see. I, I, you know, there's this one, I don't know what their name is, but Tex King. So Tex King is saying that he believes that somebody stole his idea. I, I talk to inventors all the time where they think that somebody stole their idea. When I get gather the facts, a lot of times I look at him like there's no way they could have stole your idea. And so I talked to a guy not that long ago and he's like, I think they stole my idea. And I'm like, well, how long ago do you show it to him? And he said, well, three weeks ago. I'm like, so how do you think they stole their idea? Well, I see it on their website now. I'm like, there's no company on the face of the planet can launch a product in three weeks. You, you're acting like a wacky inventor. They didn't steal your idea. They were working on something similar. It was three weeks that you show, three weeks ago you showed them the idea. You think they can launch a product and have it on their website in three weeks? Are you kidding me? They didn't steal your idea. So now I'm not saying that no company ever has never stolen an inventor's idea. I'm not saying that. But a lot of times, you know, people are coming out. If you come up with an idea and you sit around long enough, somebody else will probably come out. If it's a good idea, something similar it happens all the time. So, um, so I'm not going to get into the specific of your questions, Tex King, but um, I find that most of the time that is not the case. Um, so, you know, I, I, but, you know, it might be. I can't say. I've, I've talked to some inventors where some other company took their idea. It happens once in a blue moon, but I don't find it to be common for inventors to conduct themselves professionally. And when you analyze the situation, quite often that was not the case. But it could be. could be. Um, that's why getting a provisional patent is great protection. You know, um, so. Uh, Jules says, my name is Jules. Is Google search the best place to look for a specification for a similar idea? Yeah, Google Images is my favorite place, Jules. And then you can do Google patent search after that. But I use, always use Google Images. And I'd use Amazon too. You know, they're not industrial products on Amazon. Google Images is great for just about any type of product. Got to type a lot of different keywords. Um, all right. How much time do we have? Eight minutes left. Uh, Hassan, hi, Andrew. I have an invention that could work for two different fields with only one small modification. Can I get a PPA for each and then potentially license to two different companies? Yes. And so usually if it's a similar product but different fields, you could probably wrap that into one PPA. And you don't need to file two. And as long as these companies in different industries or areas aren't stepping on each other's toes, perfectly okay. So I would move forward. There's probably going to be two different sell sheets with two different versions of the product, two different lists of companies. You might have 20 companies in each different industry. Whichever one you license to first, keep the rights for that other version in your licensing contract. And they'll probably be totally okay with that if it doesn't hurt them. And that's perfectly acceptable. And that's pretty common. We get students working on that quite often. What I'd recommend if you have a product that kind of fits in two different categories, I'd figure out which one's going to be like easiest for them to implement, has the biggest benefit. Maybe one of those two versions of it for two different industries, one's easier to implement, makes a little more sense than the other. I'd go for the lowest hanging fruit first. You go from both at the same time, but then you got two sell sheets, you could probably do it in one PPA and two different lists of companies. People, when they're new to this, get overwhelmed because it'd be like working on two products, basically. So I'd pick whichever one's easiest, work on that one first, and then work on the other one. Uh, let's see. Wow, Jules, you got a lot of questions, let's, which is great. Fantastic. Let's answer some other ones. Um, uh, Nick says, hi, Andrew. Really enjoy your shows. Do you and Steven still offer IP portfolio consultations? Thank you in advance. I don't know what an IP portfolio consultation is. Um, there's been some cases in the past where I, God, I did it one time where I said, anybody that wants me to review their product, I'll take a look at it. And I was 
almost eight to five solid for two weeks. I can't do that again. That was craziness. And I was exhausted. My wife got really mad at me because I worked myself from the ground doing that. And um, a, a percentage of those people ended up signing for coaching, but a lot of people didn't. And it didn't really make sense for us to do that. And I think that a lot of evaluation of a product is, is something that our coaches really go deep into with the students. And so when we evaluate products with our students, it's not like the coach goes, oh, that one sucks. That one's good. Work on that one. That's, that's garbage. You don't learn anything from that. If the coach can see you did your research and you're presenting them your research, then he's like, okay, let's figure this out. Here are the upsides and downsides of this project. Here are the upsides and downsides of number two and number three project. Okay. But a lot of times the coach is like, well, you don't have all the info yet. You need to go out and find this and then we'll decide together what makes sense. So this kind of like product evaluation where people like, oh, tell me if it's good or bad. This one's like, and it's not that clear. It's, it's a good coaching evaluation looks at all the different angles. That one sucks. That one's good. I'll, and it's quite often not what you think. Like people think like number one's the bomb. I'm like, no, number two, beautiful first project because of this and this and this. And we're teaching our students to evaluate their projects. So it's very time consuming. It's very involved. And that's why I'll never be doing that for free again, because it was just way too involved. It sucked up two weeks of my time, like solid. And it was, it's, it's, so we do do that for, um, now if you're talking about, uh, and IP strategy and stuff for really complicated projects. Yeah, we could do some sort of custom thing there, but um, let me know what you're looking for. Who was who that? I think that was Nick, but you could drop me an email at Andrew and invent right Nick and let me know what you're looking for. And it give you some more specifics. Um, okay. Uh, Upscale lure says, what if you, you get a provisional patent for your idea and you never get a patent. Can someone else patent the same idea? Um, thank you. P.S. I just ordered the new book off Amazon. Can't wait to read it. I think he's talking about our LinkedIn for licensing book, which is going to be a great, it's a great book. Um, I got the PDF version of it and I read it long before it came out. It's a great book, guys. Um, LinkedIn for licensing. Okay, so that's not the title of the book. I don't have it on my desk here, but um, if you go to our website, you'll find it. Go to InventRight. You'll find it as a resource. Um, so upscale lures, yeah, technically that could happen. Um, if you create a paper trail on what you send to companies and when that creates the paper trail, it shows you're the first true inventor. It could happen. People ask me that question all the time. I've never seen it happen. I've never had one of our students present to a company privately, and then later that company knocked them off. So theoretically, it could happen, but I've never seen it happen. So I don't think it's something to really worry a whole bunch about. Um, think about the liability because you showed it to them. You had a provisional patent when you showed Then later they come out with it and you've got that paper trail on what you invented and when and when you showed it to them. That, that could be a definite liability for them. Um, let's see. Uh, Okay, let's go to somebody I haven't. Mike says, hi, Andrew. Uh, There's a different new Mike. Uh, I just want to say I'm thankful for this company and thank you for doing this every week. Is there going to be, um, give any examples? Is there going to he any examples like you guys did last year? For example, a win smart free smart IP. I don't know what your question is, Mike. Um, are we going to have any contests? Yeah, possibly. Uh, do we, I don't know if we ever had a contest. Yeah, we think we did have one where you win smart IP. Um, I, we don't have any contests right now. Right now, in the month of October, which we've never done before, if you sign up for our boot camp, um, we never discount our program ever. But we do give extra sometimes, and we've done an extra month before, but in the month of October until October 31st, if you're watching this video in the future, 2020, we're giving two extra months. I have literally never done that before. I don't know if we'll ever do it again. That sounds cheesy when I say it like that. But if you sign up by October 31st, you get two extra months, so you get eight months instead of six. So that's something that we're doing right now. It's not a giveaway, but it is something cool. Um, 
So another different Mike, Mike Eicher says, I've been watching you guys for two years. Best advice ever. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Canada loves you. Yeah, Canadians, we love Canadians as well. Um, biggest countries that we're in, U.S. I almost think that we have more Australians even before Canadians. It probably shocks a lot of you. Canadians and Australians and then a lot of European countries. And we have a lot of expats and some Asian countries. Um, uh, we really don't have many students that aren't expats in countries like China or something. Um, but we have had students in over 65 countries. And yeah, some of those are like one, I think we had one student on a French Polynesian island. That counts as a country. So it sounds more impressive than it is, but I'm very proud that we educate people from around the world, um, including Canada. So thank you, Mike. Um, in Invotronics is the handle. A company asked me to send them a product info by mail, not email. Is that a red flag? Kinda. Um, this seems a little archaic. Um, what I, you know, and it's kind of like almost like, is that going to be a waste of time? Are they just trying to make me jump through hoops because they're not really open to ideas? So you could take whatever sell sheet you have, you could print it up at Kinko's, make a color, and you could mail it to them. So it takes a little bit of time. I'd do it. Um, it's kind of a pain in the ass, kind of silly. It's a little bit of a red flag, but they might just be weird. Um, it might be just having you jump through hoops because they're not really open to ideas. I don't know. Um, but uh, I, I would go ahead and do it anyway. What the hell? I mean, just if you have a nice sell sheet, get it printed up. Can't do it if it's a video. If it's a video, say, no, my presentation is a 60-second video. Here's the link. But um, go ahead and mail it off to them. Um, but if they say, send it to whom it may concern, then you're like, mm, it's going to go into a black hole there. If they're like, send it to Bob Smith. Okay. It's pretty, pretty silly, though. Um, and let's see. Nick said it was offered by Stephen on the InventRight website a few years back. Uh, I, I don't know, Stephen, uh, uh, Nick, as far as the IP portfolio review. Um, and if, if it was, I was probably the one doing it. Um, but yeah, to go over like 10 products or eight products, it's extremely time consuming. Um, so we don't, we're not currently doing that. Um, but like I said, I did do that and I was booked solid for two weeks from eight to five. I think I had a half an hour break and that was freaking exhausting. Um, I, so I did, I have done that. I think I did it twice. It was a glutton for punishment. I enjoyed doing it. Um, so, uh, but Nick, you know, just book an appointment with me if you want to talk, um, uh, drop me an email, Andrew Inventright. Said I'm, I was on your YouTube show. You said I could book an appointment with you, and we can talk about the program. You can give me an overview of what type of products you're working on. I'm not going to evaluate like ten products or something, but we can we can have a discussion. Um, uh, the the Corian is the handle. Have you ever seen an inventor struggling to license their product and thought I could license this product in five minutes? Never. <laughs> because it's not that easy. Um, Steve and I make it seem easy, and I think it is easy, but it still takes time. So even though the effort to license your product is like a fraction of the work that it takes to venture and ma manufacture, sell a product yourself, it still takes time. Like to make your list of companies, I would say it takes two to 10 hours to make your list of companies if you're going to do it right and have like 20, 30 companies. And some products only have eight or 12, but it could take two to 10 hours to do. I mean, yeah, a lot of people it takes four, but sometimes it will take eight and it's totally worth your investment and don't be lazy and don't put in the time if it takes you eight hours to make your list of companies. So with that kind of thing said, that's just on one aspect of it. Then you need to make a sell sheet and it's like, so then you need to reach out. And some companies that are worth reaching, Corian, you need to reach out eight or nine times. Other times, very first time they're like, oh, that's Bob, just send him an email. He's great about responding and everything in between. So there's no way you have a product where it's like, oh, I, what you wrote, oh, I think I could license that in five minutes. No, I've never seen a product, no matter how great it is, where I said I could license that in five minutes because it's a process. And even though it's a great product and you great presentation and you know people are going to be responsive to it, you still have to do that work. There's nothing that takes five minutes, nothing. So um, hopefully that's helpful. Um, let's see. So... 
It's 5.04. Um, I have plenty of energy, but I think we're going to call it a night. I'm going to be doing this again next Monday, so come on back. Um, if you haven't heard it, heard us talk with all the – I think – I don't quote me on this. I think we have over 600 videos. I forget the number. I over 400 or 600. Does it really make a difference? Watch your videos. I think they're fantastic. I'm biased. We have a lot of great videos. Um, you learn a lot by watching our videos. We really give a lot away for free. So watch our videos. And if you want to ask more questions, come on back next Monday. If you want to sign up for a coaching program, go to InventRight, click on coaching, learn more there. We have other products that can be helpful as well. Um, and I want to remind everybody, I like to, follow, to end our chats this way. Coming up with ideas is probably for 95% of you part of who you are. Just happened to you one day. So to become empowered with real life experience and to actually get it out to companies is essential because after a while, you'll come up with idea after idea and you're not getting them out to companies. What's the point? It's like an artist that paints in their garage and never shows anybody what they did. That's, that's frustrating. So you're going to have to put in the work, you're going to have to do the work to get in front of companies and none of it will be as much fun as coming up with the idea, but you have to learn it. And hopefully from this live chat, watching other videos, you realize anybody can do this. You just have to put the time in. And to me, if you put two to six hours a week, it's plenty. You won't get it all done in one week, but you will move forward through projects. So go past beyond coming up with the ideas, past prototypes, past throwing money at attorneys and use the event right approach and you can license products the rest of your life. Um, but be put the time in to learn whether it's becoming a student, getting coaching or whether it's um, watching our YouTube show, reading our books, you know, at a more affordable level, whatever it is, put the work in, do it. Um, if you never work on your ideas, companies won't rip you off. You're going to rip yourself off. It's very rare that companies rip you off, but inventors rip themselves up all the time out of their own fears and moving forward. So hopefully, you've got to fall off my arm wrestler. So hopefully, taking action and moving forward, you'll feel empowered. You'll feel good about it. You'll feel a little uneasy at times. That's normal for learning anything new. And I want to remind everybody, take care, keep inventing, and we'll catch up with you guys next time. See you guys. Bye.